Dr. Demartini, welcome to the program. Yes, thank you so much. Congratulations on your latest book. Is this number 40-something? Uh, I don't know. I've done so many books now. I'm not sure. I think it's around that. <laughs> okay, so this one's called The Values Factor, The Secret to Creating an Inspired and Fulfilling Life. And in the book, you say that many of us have ideas about what our values are supposed to be, but those ideas don't necessarily reflect what our values actually are. Can you tell me about that? Well, when I ask people, and I've had the opportunity to ask thousands of people, what is it that you believe you value most and what's most important in your life? Very commonly, people will share uh, what they what I would call social idealisms, injected values by authorities, and sort of a herd social influence on them instead of looking at what their life really truly demonstrates as vital. And uh, so I developed in the book, The Values Factor, a series of questions to help elicit what is truly most important in their life based on what their life actually, their actions really demonstrate. So the process in the book, I believe, is called the value determination process. And I took yeah. it over the, over the weekend and um, I know what it illuminated for me. But tell us what completing this process will help us understand. Well, many people, like I say, have these fantasies or unrealistic um, ideas about what they think is important. But when we actually look down at what they actually do, it, it's something different. Not all cases, but most cases. So I look at how people fill their space because things that are really, really, really valuable to them, that are important to them, they keep things around them. And when it's not, they throw it in the trash or the attic or the garage. Then I look at how they spend their time because they always make time for things that are really important and they run out of time for things that aren't. Then I look at what is it that energizes them because when they have more energy at the end of the day than when they started, that means they're doing something that's meaningful. Then I look at what they spend their money on because they find money for things that are valuable and they run out of money for things that aren't. I look at then what they are most organized in and ordered in. Then I look at what they're most disciplined in that nobody ever has to remind them to do, that they spontaneously act on. Then I look at what they, their innermost feelings of thoughts are. What do they think about most that they show as reality? It means if it doesn't come true in their life and they're thinking about it, then it's a fantasy. But if it's coming true and they're showing it in their life, then it's real. Then what do they visualize that shows evidence in their life that's coming true? What do they talk to themselves that shows evidence in their life that's coming true? What do they keep wanting to talk to other people about <laughs> and keep bringing the conversation to? What is it that inspires them? What are the most common goals that they keep working on that no matter what, they keep making happen and come true? And the last one is what is it they can't wait to get up and learn, read, study, or listen to most? If you look at those, that really gives a real definition of what's most important in their life. And it doesn't always match what they think it's supposed to be. And what I found was that the answers to the very powerful questions that you're asking actually had me feeling far more connected to the values that were reduced, if you like, by the process, then the platitudes is what the other values that I thought I had were. Exactly. The social idealisms. See, we're, we, anytime we subordinate to one authority or a herd instinct that, we, we, that because of the fear of losing and being rejected by people, we inject the values of other people and we cloud the clarity of what we're really dedicated to. And that's where we lose our power. That's where we don't see the magnificence of ourselves. And that's when we hold ourselves back from doing something extraordinary in their life. Mm, thank you. Uh, many of the people listening are in their own business and they will be familiar with Mary Kay Ash, who's the founder of Mary Kay Cosmetics. Can you retell the great advice that she gave you about prioritizing? Yes, many years ago, 27 years ago, I had the opportunity to speak to about 4,500 women at her organization. And afterwards, he got the opportunity to speak with her. And I asked Mary Kay, uh, you know, Mrs. Ash, what is it that you would advise a young aspiring speaker traveling the world uh, how to fulfill his dreams? And she said, every day, write down the six or seven highest priority actions that you can do each day that are truly most important, most productive, most efficient, most priority actions you can think of that help you fulfill your dreams. And then do those and only those. Don't put down 20 or 30 where you feel goal overrun, where you always feel like you never get it all done. Just six or seven that you commit to doing that are actions that day and don't stop till they're done. Then reward yourself for them mm -hmm. and keep a list of all the grateful things that you have as a result of that. Well, I've been doing that all these years, and I can tell you that that was a catalyst in me having the greatest largest gratitude book that probably of everybody. <laughs> and, and I mean, it's, it's literally 2,000 pages and it's multiple wow. volumes now. 
And then um, it's also given me the opportunity to do what I do. I just travel the world now and speak, like she asked. And I asked her. Thank you. Um, I believe that most of us really do want to do something great with our lives. And I really like the quote in the book that said, give yourself permission to do something extraordinary. How does aligning with our values allow us to do that which is extraordinary? Well, every time we, because everybody lives by a set of priorities, a set of values, things that are most important to least important in their life, whenever they set goals that are congruent and aligned with the highest value, priority number one, numero uno, whenever they do, they have the highest probability of achievement, the highest probability of being inspired from within to act, and they end up seeing opportunity, making decisions quickly, and acting on those opportunities to awaken their natural born leadership and they have more certainty in their life, their self-worth goes up. As a result of it, their willingness to do more and serve more and accomplish more and do something extraordinary with life just becomes spontaneous. And that's – anytime you're doing the ABCs of life, not the XYZs of life, you ma become master of your destiny, not victim of your history, and you end up giving yourself permission to do something more. You have more self-worth, you receive more income, and you make bigger difference. I want to talk about those of us who seek out entrepreneurship as a career. Um, do you feel that we do that because we want to spend our time in an area that is aligned with our values, that is meaningful to us? Well, in my observation, people who feel trapped in a career that's uninspiring to them versus entrepreneurs that are going after something and giving themselves permission to do something that's a service that means something to them, they have an advantage. They have an economic advantage, for one, and they also have the advantage to take command of their life and be their own master. They're the captain of their own ship. So they probably grew up with more challenge, which made them precociously independent and used to being uh, challenged, so they basically took the risk. But as a result of that, they have more fulfillment generally. But some people are kind of umbilical cords looking for a place to plug in because they're basically looking for security. Mm. They usually don't end up having the ideal job unless they learn the art, as I say in the book, The Values Factor, on how to link whatever they're doing in their job to what is meaningful to them. Well, that comes, um, brings us to the next question very, very well, and that is how do our values dictate our company's destiny You know, when we're the business owner? Well, any time you're selecting, I've been blessed to work and consult with hundreds of companies, some of them very large, some very small. And um, any time they're, they're selecting a CEO or selecting a leader, the values of that leader will dictate what happens in the company. And for instance, very commonly, mothers who end up becoming entrepreneurs and leaders, they will still have some tendency to run the company as if they're running it as a mother, as a, as a caring for their, for their big family. And uh, men will have a different style because they may have a different set of values. So the hierarchy of one's values dictates their destiny, and it dictates the destiny of their company, and it dictates the management style that they do. Because every decision a human being makes is based on what they believe will give them the greatest advantage over disadvantage, greatest reward over risk. And so the hierarchy of one's values as a leader impacts what they decide, how they communicate with people, and the people they hire or people they inspire. I had a mentor say to me once, uh, the problem with you, they were his words, <laughs> is that you're not money-focused, you're mission-focused. And I was reflecting on that when I was reading this part in the book, um, because obviously financial security and profitability is important to me, but for me, what this made me realise is that my commitment to making a difference overrides that is more important than that. Well, the hierarchy of one's values dictates their financial destiny also. And unless somebody has a true value on building a business that serves greater numbers of people, a true value on refining and managing that business where it's efficient and producing profits, a true value on saving an ever-progressive portion of the profits so there's accumulating some, some margins, a true value on investing it so the money starts working for them instead of them having to work for money, a true value in accumulating a wealth, and a true value of having a financial cause that leaves a financial legacy, the probability of them being financial independent is very low. Only 1% actually obtain financial independence. And in all the ones that I've worked with, mm. and I know some very wealthy people, I've interviewed more than 20 billionaires, and um, they all have a high value on wealth. They have a value on serving people, a value on money, and a value on themselves. And that's why they end up with the money, because money circulates through the economy from those who value it least to those who value it most. Mm. How does living life by your values make each day as you describe in your life, more like a holiday than a work day? 
Well, most people have a what I call the Monday morning blues, Wednesday hump days. Thank God it's Fridays and we free it. <laughs> and what they do is they basically work hard at something they're not inspired by so they can get away and have immediate gratification on a little vacation and wipe out whatever they saved so they can get back in the rut and work. And they've separated schizophrenically their vocation from their vacation. And to me, you need to merge those together. If you're not doing what you love and loving what you do, either because you've selected it or because you've learned the art of linking whatever you're doing to what is meaningful, then you're basically missing out on your life and you'll age quicker and you'll, you'll, you won't tap dance to work. You'll have to go up and go to work, not because you're inspired to and can't wait to, but because you have to. And to me, that's not the way and wisely the way to live your life. When you can't wait to get up and go to work and you tap dance to work, people can't wait to get your service. One of the sections that I um, advise um, our listeners to read and read again is the five S's of leadership. I'll just name them very quickly. They are service, selling, specialized knowledge, speaking, and saving. And I was wondering if you could speak to us briefly about two of these. Firstly, specialized knowledge. Well... I'm, I'm a love a love of reading. I mean, I've been I've read over twenty nine thousand texts now, and I uh, I read constantly because I believe that if you don't fill your mind with wisdom and great great uh, minds, uh, you pass up on the great opportunities. You have to learn through trial and error and telenomics and tele telelogics, and I think that it's wise to stand on the shoulders of giants and not sit in anybody's shadows. So I think that filling your mind and gaining specialized knowledge and becoming an expert and a master of what you do brings more opportunities, brings more fulfillment, um, because you end up mastering a leadership role. And when you're a leader, you have more accountabilities, but you also have more fulfillment and opportunities. Mm. And selling. You know, the selling is a topic that I know our community loves and hates. Well, selling, the reason why some people have difficulty selling is not because of actually selling. It's because not knowing how to sell. Mm. Because selling is a definition of it is really caring. When you truly care about humanity, you're going to want to go and find out what their true needs are, and you want to directly or indirectly find a way of meeting those needs. And selling is asking questions. It's never telling. It's asking questions to help establish what they really want and making sure that you do what you can to help them fulfill that. That's the true definition of selling. But what many people have done is they projected their product, service, or ideas, made assumptions and projections and presumptions onto people, which offends people, and they've associated with the illusion of what it's selling is about and given selling a, a name that's not really what it's, what it's meant for. It's designed to help fill the needs of other human beings. People that are poor mm -hmm. and people that don't sell mm -hmm. are people that don't care. Because if you really, really care about somebody, you, you listen to them, find out what their needs, and you do what you can to help them. And when you have the product, or indirectly have it as a broker, you help them, and you deserve to have a reward. And the more you help people, the more rewards you get to have. Mm, that's a great way to reframe that. How does – well, let me go here. You say that inside everyone there is a genius, which is good news. Now, how does connecting with our values allow us to tap into this part of ourselves? Well, every human being loves learning what is truly most important, most valuable to them, what's meaningful to them. Just like a child that loves his video games or a little sports person that loves their, their sports or a person who's an entrepreneur who loves building businesses or a woman that loves to maybe raise a beautiful family or an entrepreneur, a woman that has an entrepreneurship. It doesn't matter. Whatever is most important to them, they love learning. And any time they can see that whatever they're, they're involved in is helping them fulfill their highest values, their absorption, they're, they're like a sponge, and they activate the natural-born genius that we all have. I'm really certain. I mean, I get to work with children. I've worked with thousands and thousands of children and teachers and principals around the world. And I'm absolutely certain that you can take a child that has been labeled ADHD, labeled disobedient, labeled attention deficit, all, I mean, all kind of labels. You can find out what the child's highest values are. And once you access that, you can link any class to that and activate him, and all of a sudden he'll absorb those classes. It's mind-blowing to watch. I've done it hundreds of times, thousands of times, and it's, a, it's very inspiring to see. I have a child right now who's 11, who's a student of mine, mm. who's already read 15,000 books. He's reading wow. 40 a day now <laughs> because we taught him some principles on how to do that. He's mind-blowing. I went to the Institute of Advanced Studies and met with Freeman Dyson, who's like the Stephen Hawking of America. Mm -hmm. With this boy, we had a four-and-a-half-hour discussion on astrophysics. He's, he's 11. He was nine when we met. This is the kind of thing that's possible Incredible. when you know how to ap activate this genius in people. Mm -hmm.
The book is The Values Factor, The Secret to Creating an Inspired and Fulfilling Life. Dr. DiMartini, is there anything you'd like to leave us with? Well, just that main statement that everybody deep inside has something amazing to do. Whether I'm speaking to prisons or whether I'm speaking to principals or leaders or governments or presidents, one thing I'm absolutely certain is every human being has a desire to make a difference, do something amazing with their life, leave some sort of legacy and do something extraordinary so they can say at the end of their life they did everything they could with everything they were given. And I say give yourself permission to do it. Don't let the world on the outside dictate your destiny. Let the heart and soul and the voice and vision on the inside determine what you really want in life. Give yourself permission to go out there. Don't think about rejection. Don't worry about any of the fears in life. Just go after what you want because the synchronicities and the people, places, things, ideas, and events in your life start to surround you and give you a greater opportunity if you act wisely like that. Dr. Martini, congratulations on the book and thank you once again for joining us. Thank you so much.